we have achieved really amazing results, and these results I want to share with you. I will not explain you uh, how you should do or what you should do exactly, but I can share with you what we did, and you will see also the results which we got. And that's for me um, really something what I'm excited about. I'm excited about the results which we have achieved, and I want to share them with you. So, uh, let me start. Uh, what we will talk about, we will talk about the um, situation in which we were, and how did we actually um, then discover the, okay, the problem is existing, which we have to resolve. Then I'll touch the problem for a moment, and then we'll come at what did we do, and what was the effect of that. So, no theory, almost. So it's, uh, it's about me, uh, I'm, I'm Gaitis. I'm working now in Germany, in south of Germany, Munich, which is extremely nice region. This is uh, the kind of view which you can see from almost my office. I have to still go out from office to see that a lot of forests around, mountains, so we can think and come up with something really great, which we also manage somehow. So, um, yeah, I'm married, I have three children, so somehow I have to also divide the time. Children, work, work, children. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm working with the European Genomics already since almost seven years. It has been some time. I have come through also a lot of challenges, and at the end, we have reached one state which we can, uh, we can call that, okay, we have achieved something. So let's look. Um, Eurofins Genomics is uh, the company which is global company. It's part of the European Scientific. European Scientific is having 40,000 uh, employees all over the world, uh, multi-billion business. We are a rather smaller part of that, but we are still a global company who is doing uh, um, business in, in the area of, of genomics. So genomics, that means genetic analysis and, and production of, of genes. So we do the oligosynthesis, gene synthesis, we do the next generation sequencing, uh, we do the classical sequencing, we do the microarrays. Um, basically, it's all around the um, discovery, what is inside our body, how to use it, uh, how to produce drugs for uh, us also, which could or even cure uh, the illnesses which were uh, also considered as uncurable in the past. That's what we do. And as we do a lot of uh, um, all this, we, um, we have also the IT organization, which is also uh, global, mostly global. So we have the development center here in, in Bangalore. And I'm really happy um, that we decided for that. Um, I'm really happy how, um, how good and how professional our organization is, is working here, how good uh, are the people whom uh, also we are getting. And it has been a real pleasure working with, with India in, uh, in the last, okay, I have been working with India even before that, so like 12 years now. Um, besides India, we have also a few more locations and we have a whole bunch of applications which, uh, which we are using starting from the production applications, which are uh, manufacturing execution systems, there are laboratory information systems, uh, e-commerce platform, uh, platforms for quoting, for support processes, for ordering processing. So we have, if, if we count all the applications which we have in the organization, it will be um, around 40 uh, or 50 applications. That depends which ones you count as, as real applications. So, uh, and software is really a core in the, in our business. We have highly automated industrial scale processes. And we are producing the samples overnight. It's, it's really express. If uh, the patient is on the other side and he expects the medical treatment, he has to get answer very quickly what exactly is a type of cancer, for example, which, which he's having so that the treatment can be um, then started immediately. Um, so it's really the software is is a core. We have to automate everything. And the customer also expects that uh, the results from what we are doing are delivered also automatically and in the form how, how he needs them so that he can integrate in their processes. And again, 
with the time. The time is, is everything. Okay, not everything. There is a second part, which is at least as crucial, it's quality. You see, we, we are producing information and we are producing also the substances which are afterwards either used for producing the drugs or directly placed into the patient. So we have uh, the huge responsibility for uh, the patient, for the health of, of the patient, for his life or, or death. Um, of course, because of that, we, we have to ensure that the, uh, the samples cannot be mixed, that we cannot by accident analyze the wrong sample and, and give the wrong data out. So the quality, the quality is really it's um, off, before or after the speed, uh, it depends with uh, exactly which customer you are talking about, but uh, either of two is um, the crucial part. So how do we ensure? Of course, the industry knows that, um, and there are other companies also who are, are doing this. Uh, so there are multiple things what, what everybody is doing. It's, it's CMMI, CMMI everybody knows, right? Uh, the GAMP5, it's um, 350 pages uh, of uh, um, approach description on high level how you should uh, program and validate the software. And then it's extended with many thousands of pages how exactly you should apply these generic rules. Then we have, uh, of course, as industry practice, all the SQA with testing, analyzing, validating, and, and, uh, and ensuring that there are no bugs. And of course, we also applied most of these, maybe not everything to 100%, but we also uh, uh, are seeing my level three. We are doing uh, the GAM5 based software development. Yes, we are. Uh, also, we were using uh, the test automation and the QA team was responsible for ensuring the quality of the software and uh, regular internal and external audits also were happening. Our customers were coming to us and checking how do we create the software, what are our, our lab processes. These are very big pharma companies, right? They have to ensure that uh, the, the company which is delivering the data to them is also of uh, of highest compliance. Um, and of course, measuring and following appropriate KPIs, defect density, the defect leakage, um, all, of, all of that, what, what we are doing. So, and uh, yeah, of course, it's ISO, uh, ISO 13485. It's, it's special ISO for the medical devices, which software is also considered as medical device because we are using it for producing the drugs which will be placed into the patient. GAM5, the GXP, um, the good manufacturing practices, good laboratory practices, good clinical practices under FDA, CLIA certification, and so on and so on. So it must have been of uh, the great quality, right? There shouldn't be any defects whatsoever. With all of that, what we are doing, and still, what do we saw? Uh, what do we see there? Uh, we uh, observed that our defect rate is growing. And okay, it's a little bit fluctuating, but it's growing overall. Um, we have faced the very lengthy release cycles, waiting for um, the releases. Then the, the production says, oh, um, let's just club the efforts for uh, the validation. Let's make even bigger release so that we can save some time on, on validation. It was like a cycle, a cycle all the time, and revalidation effort for everything what comes into the lab. And then um, and we were planning also uh, the releases and also the rollbacks so that if, if we have delivered bad software, but it can be rolled back easily, and the support effort was only, only increasing. So we see also here like uh, these, uh, these lines are fluctuating, but it's going up, it's defect density, right? So it's far above um, whatever zero, it's uh, above even the yellow line, it was defined as still acceptable quality. So that's where we were. Now, um, what about agile in, in that situation, right? Lengthy release cycles, uh, quality going up and down, and, and combining more and more uh, into the bigger and bigger batches. Uh, you know, of course, we were still doing some scrum thing, right? Some prints and uh, retrospects and all of that, but uh, we were not agile anymore. We were uh, in waterfall world, running just with some sprints. Okay, sprints are cool, but it's still waterfall. Um, so agile, agile versus compliance. It's like okay, it's uh, it's very simple. Either either you are agile or or you are compliant. 
So on, on one side, we want to be agile, but we have to be also, also compliant. So we first do the compliance, and then whatever is left over, we can do agile way, right? So we do all the processes and validations and, and contracts and uh, following the nice waterfall plan, and then, then we do all of that in an agile way. Cool, but, well, it's not, it's not so great. Um, then we asked ourselves, why? Why we want to be agile? Okay, we want to be really fast. We want to uh, uh, also be the first ones in the market, right? Uh, at, at the end, we really, all what we want, we want to beat our, our competitors and earn a lot of money. That's, that's what companies do, right? Um, and because of that, we want to be also compliant because the pharma customers are having a lot of money, which they could give us, so we should somehow take that money. Um, and because of that, we have to be competitive on, on the market for compliance. So there is a problem, what to do. Uh, so agile versus uh, ensure quality, which is at the end, sometimes it is not so much about ensure quality than certify quality, because we saw that the quality was not there, right? What if that quality fluctuating all the time um, meant for ensuring quality at the end, it's, uh, it's just uh, all, the, all the check boxes which you tick to say we have done everything what we could. Sorry, guys, if the quality is not there, it's not there, but, but we have certified we have done everything. So, um, so we understood there is really a challenge, but uh, what to do about that, right? Okay, um, understanding that we have a problem is good, but what to do about it? Now there is a conflict. So um, I thought again about the quality. What is the, percep uh, the perception of, of the quality? What is understood with the quality and with the defects? And at the end, bugs are normal, right? It's, it's part of software. Somehow, whatever you, you get is having some bug here, there, but it's, it's okay, right? It's part of the process. And finding and fixing all the bugs is anyways very expensive, right? And then you will invest uh, a lot of many years in uh, understanding, really uh, rechecking the whole software and ensuring that it's, it's really of the highest quality and no bug is escaping somewhere. And we are, we are doing already ex uh, extensive testing after each sprint. We were doing all of that. We develop, then we give, uh, then to the QA, QA is spending uh, double the time for testing, then we, uh, then we give to uh, the production people, then they spend a few more months, whatever, on, on, on validation at the end still. The uh, defects are, are flowing um, like continuous flow. They always get some defects. Um, and also, if, if you speak with other people, um, the humans are doing mistakes, right? We are all humans. I do mistake, you do mistake. Uh, we all do mistakes. So, what's such a big deal about that? Um, but at the same time, what we see, the defects are not part of velocity. They are the fixing of defects is not adding any additional value to the business. The value was added already through the feature. This defect which we have given with the feature, it has reduced this feature value. So we are just, just giving back what we promised on, on the first place. So it's not adding any, any new additional value to the business. So it means that we are spending the time on doing something which uh, is of no value. Hmm. That's bad. Defects cause rework. So we are again and again working on, on the same things, right? And late discovery, which is happening uh, in QA, in UAT, or even in, in production, uh, it increases incredibly the cost for fixing it. And we see that at the moment when the code is touching the production, then fixing anything is a um, huge cost. Not only on, on the IT side, it's a cost. It uh, has, has happened also that because of the bug in software, we had to reproduce a week worth of production, just because a bug of software was there. And that's really bad. It costs really a lot of money. So it's not just IT cost which is there, it's also the business cost which is there. This kind of chart everybody has seen. Uh, uh, I was not sure about the copyrights. In Europe, you have to be very careful about that, so I draw myself. Well, nobody can accuse me <laughs> in using something what, what is not uh, allowed. So. Um, Right, uh, so 
then I fought and thought, no, but uh, let's assume that it's possible to do the zero defects. What would it change? It would change uh, a lot of things. Hmm. But uh, let me think, okay, um, the few basic principles. I was speaking with the production guys. Production guys have it all the time, right? It's uh, production is normally running on, uh, with the lean principles. You know, you, you learn from the, the defects and you improve until six sigma, zero defects and so on. But on, on software, it's not so straightforward, but at least I, I thought, okay, let me at least think how to apply the principles. So removing the obstacles between the teams and users, it's like this whole BA thing, okay? Not so popular with that, removing the BAs to just bring together the, the team and the users. We build the, uh, or we change the processes and we adapt our tools so that we can support this. This newer way of working, whatever it will be, I, I was not yet sure what exactly we need about for that, right? Moving discovery of defects to as early stage as possible, at the moment when it's still cheap to fix. The cheaper the fix, the better it is, right? Automation of everything. Uh, as we are running under the compliance, we have to still do the documentation, we have to still do the validation with that. So if, uh, if there is an action which is not adding value and which only uh, is costing the time, so automate it. And then we had also the plan B. Uh, yeah. uh, we could also analyze the gene expressions and figure out which gene expression is uh, responsible for producing the low quality code and then we could use the CRISPR um, then for repairing the, the DNA of our developers. But that was only plan B. And good we didn't have to do it. But it's possible. So um, we apply these few principles, very few principles were there, right? Um, what happened to our defect density? It's until December, I think, or January. It's uh, every of uh, this small block is three week sprint. So we did hit at the beginning, a little bit of struggle with the old legacy code. There is still a, a, a lot of buggies in, in the legacy code, so it's not that easy. But as you saw, after the, some fluctuation, we are nicely zero. So there are no more bugs. What does that mean, no more bugs? That means that we could spend the time on, on doing something, right? What production says about that, no more bugs. So theoretically, we could even skip the validation process. As you guys are anyways giving us uh, only the bug free software, we just lose our time in, in checking something what is anyways working. Okay, it's not allowed. We have to still do the validation. But it's, it's very easy. Then they are ready to do it also anytime. So, well, okay, but uh, the, the highest quality zero defects, it costs a lot, right? Because in the, in the past, it's always like, yeah, we have to be really fast. Let's uh, let's keep few of uh, these quality checks. Let's let's be fast. The quality we can fix later, right? And then oh, but yeah, if if we have to uh, give really zero defects, let's postpone our our release. Let's let's do more of the validation so that we can give zero defects. So that was the kind of thinking. So the the velocity should be also around zero, right? We spend all the time on on fixing only. Fixing, validating, checking, verifying. So this is our velocity. This is one team. Again, each bar is three weeks long. It's three weeks sprint. Hmm. Interestingly, or as production guys would say, of course, we told you, right? Um, the productivity is, is going up. I still think there is a lot of potential of uh, going up even more exponentially. Still, if you look back what we were doing, we were mostly working on defects, a uh, little bit velocity fluctuations. Uh, sometimes we were even recording the defects under, under velocity so that you can have some planning, right? Still. Now, the velocity is, is up there and it's not the limit. And the zero defects, the same team size. It's not like we added 100 more people and say, okay, now we do the, the great quality and the, the velocity. It's the uh, same team. Same team, but no defects and a lot of velocity. So, 
Um, this is a uh, acceptable, uh, how was it called, acceptable cost of quality, the sweet spot in which uh, the fixing of defects is, um, is more expensive than delivering additional functionality. My sweet spot is up there, uh, at the place where uh, we don't have defects, so we can spend all the time on, on only producing additional value. So, how we did it? As uh, I mentioned, few of the uh, problems around it, also solution was obvious. So release cycle reduction, we release often, release more. This everybody knows, right? But we just don't apply it uh, at the moment when you have to do it. Then there are always some obstacles around that. And I could say, okay, you, you need a, a huge buy-in from the business and all of that. But at the end, it comes back to the, the same, release often, release small. This is what we did, right? Then what else we did? Rethink of, of QA role. So in, instead of spending the time of QA for uh, verifying the functionality which uh, had to be uh, error-free in the first place, the QA is spending time re-verifying something what the developer has to deliver. Not really the point. So the developer was made responsible for the QA also. So uh, the developer had to do the testing also. The testing of his newly added functionality. Okay, there was also the peer testing, peer review, uh, so that it's the four eyes principle still, right? And uh, all of that, but the QA role was now more on the automation side, security testing, load and performance testing, exploratory testing, that is a lot of work still outstanding for QA. I'm not saying no QA thing. I know there is also this, this thinking around, but uh, I still think the QA role is very valuable if it's used in the right way. Ownership, the developer has to own his code, what, what he's writing. It cannot be that he just writes something, the code, and then throws over the fence to the QA, and then, okay, it's not my problem anymore. The developer is responsible end-to-end. That's why I want that also the developer experiences the pain of the users. If you, if you remove the BA from in between, and if you remove the QA from in between, the user and the developer, he will experience also the pain which the users are, are experiencing working with this, this piece of functionality which uh, the developer has delivered. And the developers, um, they are not like, uh, not wanting to do the good quality, right? They are very keen to give the, good, the, the great quality, and I just uh, allow them and to do it. I don't stand in the way for them. So, um, of course, the other basic principles, like um, you should not assume that the user will do in the right sequence, right way, that the uh, systems will be up, that the services will be running, and all of that. That's all we know, right? Everybody knows that, that you should build for the stability. You should not just build in the, the functionality and then hope nothing happens and user doesn't click that other button. Um, the peer review and, and testing, which I uh, noticed, it, um, which I, I mentioned before also, it's, uh, it's not just about ensuring that uh, this code is working. Uh, as for me, it's also about the pride. If, if you uh, show the um, other person what you have done, and you say, okay, this is the code which I have done, and that other person is other developer. So if I will say, and you'll say, okay, but uh, what is that? What, what did you do? Uh, why did you uh, wrote it in, in such a way that it will break immediately? Come on, it's not something what I as, as a developer would do, right? It's, it's your colleague. I should have a little bit pride. And also this, uh, it helps really sharing also the knowledge and understanding about the software which we are, are developing. And then something really crazy stops the line. Um, that's one of the basic uh, lean principles in production. That at the moment when you have a, a defect, it stops the line. Stops the line and, and figure out what went wrong. Okay, it's, it's very expensive, right? Imagine the full production line is stopped just because um, one small defect is there found. But if you don't do it, then the defect is not an exception anymore. 
And if uh, the defect is not an exception, then you quickly end up in exactly the same situation as we ended in the first place. So we stop the line. It helps us also learn from defects. How does it uh, look like? Actually, it's okay, it's, uh, it's very theoretical. Oh, okay, you, you have to stop the line. This is how it looks like. We did it. So, um, not because of copyrights, but, uh, but just because we wanted uh, to do something quickly and not wait for uh, some special instrument to do it for us. So we did something like that. So normally there is a green light. The goal is the name of, of, of one project. So it's, it's normally it's a green light. And whoever discovers a defect, whoever sees something is going wrong, goes there and there is some button here which you can press. And then there are, uh, the light will become red and the signal will come, acoustic signal. And what happens? The team stops working. The team stops working and comes there, the full team, not only the guy who discovered and somebody from QA as a help or other way around. It's really the full team who has to come there. They will come, they will discuss what happened, what went wrong, what we can learn from that, right? The defect is a learning opportunity. So you stop the full work, you figure out what went wrong, and you can discuss also how you will fix it, of course. All the experts are there, so you can discuss how to fix that. This is uh, one of the, um, the powerful tools which we built. And we didn't change the design much uh, after that also. It still looks this, uh, pretty much the same. Not uh, very extremely cool and nice, but it does its job. It stops the line. So, then of course we do the continuous code monitoring. Uh, that's uh, something what we added um, not as long time ago. So you can still, still see there also a lot of issues are ongoing, there are duplicated items and code is, uh, is not well documented. Maintainability is not yet as high as, as it should be. It's SonarCube, by the way. Um, but the, the basic idea is that you have to invest. You have to invest in maintainability of, of your code. If you don't invest, your code will naturally evolve into a uh, more chaotic state. That's the, the basic physics principle, by the way. That everything is, is changing into more chaotic state than before unless you add some energy to it. Only then you can increase the order instead of chaos. So the quality gate, we, um, we call it, and, um, and this is uh, also where all our code is, is going through it. Still, as I, as I mentioned before, regulation, so we have to do also the documentation. Without documentation, you cannot do anything. Um, then there are a few principles um, which we try to follow. I don't say that we are ideal in that, but uh, this is what we try to do, and we try more and more of that. Documentation should be generated instead of, uh, of writing, and uh, what I mean with that, uh, at the end, uh, a lot of the tools are out there which can generate your documentation from uh, the test cases, from uh, the test steps, from uh, the acceptance criteria, from uh, the code comments. No regulation says that you have to write uh, all your documentation uh, sitting at the keyboard and, and typing actually something and then signing something physically. That's not what, what regulations say. They require documentation. It has to be clearly documented uh, how it works. And there is this executable documentation. In uh, the most simple case, it's acceptance criteria. Um, then there is also the test automation which comes on top. That's the documentation, right? It documents exactly how your code is, is working. That's the best documentation you can any time you can ensure that your code is exactly working as described in this document, which is uh, uh, the test cases for automation, right? That's exact documentation. Um, late documentation, it's not like, uh, like we are being late in, in preparing the documentation at the moment when already auditors are there. No, what I mean is that we don't prepare documentation before we deliver the, the functionality, basically. The more you wait with that, the more precise you will be and the less time you will spend, 
right? Otherwise, you would be describing and documenting something what, uh, which might never come. Electronic cover paper, this is what we are, are trying now to, to do. Ideally, I would like that uh, the application itself is, is a documentation that, uh, that for any, any feature you can any time produce uh, the proof that this is the functionality, how it is, and this is a, a documentation for that, and that the people in the lab would even use our application for validation process also. Uh, they would uh, come just at the screen at the machine, at, at some robot, and just check working, 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 and then uh, and with um, uh, the fingerprint or with RFID chip, then approve, yes, I, I have validated, and that's it. And then any time an auditor comes, then we can produce as much documentation as they want. How much you want? 3,000 pages, 10,000, whatever. We can produce. Then we can print even out if they are so keen on, on, uh, on printed documentation, but otherwise it's not our business. And we are not in, into documentation business. Um, but still, I cannot say that it just diminishes completely. Some documentation still will exist. Sorry for that. I have not, no better news for that. There will be always a need for some documentation, even some written signature with blood or something so that you can really verify that you take the responsibility for this patient who will die if you have done something wrong. And normally it's at the end, at least the general manager has to sign because he will go into the prison if it will not work. So, um, and then the last step for me was always follow the plan. Okay, we, uh, we are all agile, so we do the uh, sprint, and then we do the replan, and then we reprioritize the backlog and think everything is good. But at the end, you have to, uh, if we are building up the new lab, or if we acquire another company, you cannot say, mm, okay, uh, yeah, we will be working on, on some functionality based on the priority, whatever the product owner will decide, and then at some moment in time because we don't commit also uh, and we will deliver something. Of course, the other side of it is, oh, okay, let's, uh, let's just uh, write down everything what is required, right? And then we will estimate and then using uh, very nice and advanced planning techniques with uh, the previous story points and with machine learning, then we can somehow estimate better, right? And then, uh, then we know that we will hit the line. Um, this is our strategic roadmap. You can't really see, and even in uh, the slide handout you will not see because it's a secret. No, it's not. Uh, actually, it's just <laughs> a low resolution. So you can see even a uh, few things there. But it's uh, nothing interesting. It's on a uh, very strategic uh, level there that we are working, for example, one bar is one system which we want to do. Yeah? So one bar, one system, no details. As it's far in the future, I have no idea what I have to do there. Sorry, no idea. Uh, I have to work in 2020 on, on the new system for microarray business. Okay, I will work on that. So um, how much money I have? Okay, I, I, I have money for this much people for one year. Okay, fine. That's enough for strategic roadmap, right? It's budgeting, it's roadmap, enough. If, if we do more details, what is that waterfall? So we don't want to do waterfall. So what do we do? Um, then when the time comes, and we should start with, uh, with one of these systems, which is in the far future, then we do the product roadmap. How we do the product roadmap? Um, mostly the business people do it. The production guys, uh, or if it's the production system, they would uh, identify and write down really the uh, independent blocks which can be deployed independently. That's very critical, which can be deployed independently. So it's a minimum uh, like functionality which is usable still for the lab, right? It's, uh, it's not uh, just a set of functionality which from IT perspective makes sense somehow, it's the minimum set of functionality which is usable in production. So this is like a zoom in. So I zoom in when the time comes, not before, which is very important. The commitment has to still be delayed, right? So we delay the commitment, we say, okay, now it's, the time has come, now we say. Still, okay, so, uh, all these colorful lines are program increments. So we just put some 
almost three months cycle on top, which say, okay, in this program increment, we have to work on uh, this piece of functionality, this block we have to do now. Now we have to understand what is that block doing. So we do the, uh, the breakdown and we do now the sprint planning for the next sprint only. So we don't do any planning for the future. We don't care. How do we still ensure that it's on time, right? Because the acquisitions and uh, the new lab setups, the new machines come, how do we ensure that it's still on time? And again, as copyright <laughs> thing in, <laughs> in Europe, so I draw something. So what we do, we identify the core functionality. The core functionality comes into the first sprint. If two sprints required, I'm fine with that, whatever. If three sprints required, I'm fine with that as long as it's uh, the core functionality. And, and when we work on the core functionality, what is the deal is that if somebody is, wor is working longer on core functionality and uh, another uh, uh, person or team is finished with, with their core functionality, they don't start with the next one. They go and help the other team or other person. Huh? So that at the end of, of the program increment, we have the functionality which is acceptable. Okay, it's, it can be still very core and things, but it's acceptable. Then if we have the time left, then we work on important functionality. And if we are even more lucky that we have so incredible lot of time, then we just maximize uh, the value until the end of the program increment. And we are always done. We are always on time, and we deliver the maximum value possible. So that's how we do it. So, question. Uh, I'll give you the mic, sorry. Hello? Yeah. Uh, so, I feel when we try to give importance to quality, uh, which is very important, our competitors can catch up and it could be a matter of not able to take that position again itself. But did that kind of situation happen or how did you manage uh, with the kind of uh, strict uh, policies that you have? Uh, See, the strict policies are for making us fast. If we think that uh, um, what we have to do then for beating the, fun uh, the customer is this functionality, then we will go and deliver the core. Then we will deploy the core in production. We will start using already this functionality. We will get already the value so that uh, we are as fast as the startups. We do the minimum, then we get the feedback and maybe the functionality which we thought is important is not important anymore in the meantime, right? So the team was not a distributed team. Uh, but it is. It, it, it is. is still. Okay. So how was the time zone uh, managed and honored? We are pretty lucky. Um, with Germany, it's three and a half or four and a half hours difference. Uh, the people here start late. So okay. Uh, so they start when um, in Germany the people just reach the workplace and they end when the people in Germany also go home. So. Okay, thank it's you. It's good for us. Uh, just one small question. Uh, on the graph where the defects have gone down and velocity is going mm -hmm. up, uh, are we those numbers that have gone down to zero, is that only post-production defects or includes no, UAT it's and? QA. There is not a single defect in QA. That's defect uh, density. So it's everything what is found after the development. So the QA is not finding any defects. Okay, so QA only or QA plus UAT plus post-production? All. All. It doesn't matter for me. Uh, at the end, defect is defect. Okay, thank so, you. Uh, just wanted to understand on the QA role uh, redefine, uh, how exactly and what were the steps taken to redefine the QA role? The simple answer is that I want uh, the QA to deliver more value. Retesting the functionality which the developer has tested already is kind of useless if uh, the developer has, has delivered the good quality, right? 
So I, I want that Q is spending the time on, on value added things. Like now, the QA has taken a role for um, helping us uh, achieve the GAM5 uh, full compliance. So the QA is helping now the production people to uh, ensure that our software is always validated, which was previously only the, the production headache. Now the QA has taken that responsibility. So they are spending their time on more valuable tasks. Can we go to that slide? Which one? Yeah. So one more uh, with respect to stop the line. When you say stop the line, what exactly you mean there? Stop the line, I mean stop the line. I mean at the moment when we discover defect, whatever is that in, in QA, in UAT, SIT, production, somebody comes and presses the button and then it becomes red and everybody drops the work and goes there and, and, very, uh, and checks what's the issue. And then they discuss what exactly happened and how to go about it. Okay, and it's not about the regular uh, sprint, it's if there is something critical anytime, coming out. Any, anytime when something happens, we stop immediately the work. If you are more interested about the stop the line, this guy there is stopping the line no more every day, but initially he was stopping every day. He's sitting there. So. Any more questions? You spoke about defect management and all, like how did you made this happen, like the strategies and all. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, what is the differentiated strategy which your company is having compared to your competitors which keeps you leading in the market? Because the defect management strategies which you have shown here, um, almost most of the company would be following the same kind of a strategies. So what is the differentiating aspect which you feel it had it, which is helping you to having mm -hmm. a lower defect rate? Um, I think it's uh, it's a courage. It's a courage, really, to change the things on how we work. Like uh, stop the line. It's how you will stop the work, what you are doing, right? Just for learning about the defect which you uh, encountered. Right? It's it's crazy. You have to have the courage for uh, not accepting anymore the previous state. Thank you.